Welcome to It's a Mystery. Throughout this series, we'll be shocking you and baffling you with some of the most bizarre mysteries known to man. We'll be delving right into the heart of the unknown. So join us as we attempt to solve some of the world's most amazing mysteries. Could there really be a giant ape-like monster roaming the dark unknown areas of the globe? What was it that terrified a man and his wife in the middle of the night? And what have these mysterious objects got to do with you? You'll be surprised. It's a mystery whose footprint this is. Now this is a cast of a footprint that was found beside a riverbank in America. It's nearly 40 centimetres long. That's a human size 15. It's been estimated that the mysterious creature who made these footprints must have been nearly two and a half metres tall and must have weighed about three times as much as an adult man. It's thought that a footprint like this belongs to a giant, hairy, man-like beast who lives in the forests of Northwest America. This legendary figure is known as Bigfoot. These pictures were taken by explorer Roger Patterson. Could this be photographic proof that Bigfoot really exists? What do you think? Is this Bigfoot? Or is it an escaped gorilla? Is it simply someone dressed in an ape costume? Well, believe it or not, there are reports from all around the world of other man beasts similar to the American Bigfoot living in remote areas. In Australia, there have been thousands of sightings of a man beast known as Yowie. And in the high valleys of the Himalayas in Asia, there is said to be a hairy wild man known as the Yeti, or the Abominable Snowman. In 1987, an expedition led by Sir Chris Bonington went out to the Himalayan mountains in search of this very creature. Even though he didn't actually see the Yeti, one of the members of his team found fur that may belong to it. And incredibly, even here in Britain, there have been strange sightings of some kind of man-like beast. A mountain in Scotland called Ben McDewey is said to be the home of a creature known as the Big Grey Man. On many occasions, experienced climbers claim to have seen a strange, ghostly grey figure coming towards them from the murky mists. So what do you reckon? Could there really be huge man-like beasts living in remote areas of the world? Could there really be one living in Scotland? Well, one explanation of the big grey man of Ben McDewey is that it's a strange trick of the light playing on mountain mists. In certain conditions, climbers thinking they have seen the big grey man may actually have seen a shadow of themselves. You see, on a cloudy day, if there's mist over here, and you stand with the sun behind you over there, then your shadow is actually cast onto the mist in front of you, creating a shadowy figure. Pretty scary, huh? So there's one possible explanation of the big grey man. But what of the other sightings? Well, we asked Professor Chris Stringer of the Natural History Museum, could there really be something out there that we don't know about? It is certainly possible that man-like creatures exist in the most remote areas of the planet. However, there is no scientific evidence, but we can't discount the possibility that one day we will discover that we are not alone. So the mystery remains. Could a footprint like this really belong to a Yeti, Bigfoot, or some other man-like beast? It's a mystery who or what could be lurking outside in the middle of a cold, dark night. It was just before midnight and Linda and Alan Beckett were the last guests to leave the golf club dinner dance. Luckily their house backed onto the golf course so they didn't have far to walk. They were soon in bed and asleep. But in the middle of the night, Linda was suddenly woken up by a low humming sound. A sound that raised to a pitch, died 
and started all over again. It was a sound she'd never heard before, but a sound that terrified her to her bones. She slipped out of bed and crept to the window. Nothing. But there was the noise again, coming from the direction of the golf course. She could see nothing, until in the distance, she saw a sudden burst of sparks fly up into the night sky. Linda knew something was wrong. They had been the last guests to leave the golf club, so there should have been no one there. Alan, wake up. She woke up her husband no, and grabbed some binoculars. Linda peered out into the dark night. It's over there. She could make out a group of figures standing in a circle, bowing. I can't see a thing. She strained harder to see. The figures looked strange, like they were glowing. And every so often they created a burst of sparks. Can you see? Linda was scared stiff. She looked at her husband. He was looking out through the binoculars at the frightening events outside. Then suddenly... They've got no eyes. They've just got sockets. This had gone too far. Linda rushed to the phone and called the police. Yes. Police, please. Now, uh, try and calm yourself, madam, and tell us exactly what you remember seeing, please. It was coming from the golf course. We both saw it through the binoculars. There were four or five of them, and they were sort of glowing, and there were sparks coming from them, and, and they were bowing. And my husband said they had no eyes. Right, well, uh, you get yourself inside, madam, and um, we'll take a look round, OK? By now, the police had been searching the golf course for two hours. Linda and Alan waited nervously for news. Eventually, the police returned to the house. They had found nothing. No sparks, no mysterious glowing people. They had seen and heard absolutely nothing. So who were the mysterious glowing figures with no eyes? Why were they bowing? And what made the sparks fly into the sky? What do you think? Do you think it was a sinister sighting of aliens? Or was it creatures from a paranormal universe? Well, we have managed to track down one of these extraterrestrial beings. For the first time on television, we can exclusively reveal a railway maintenance worker. Yes, the ghoulish guessing game was solved the next morning when the railwayman who had been working during the night returned back to work. The strange glowing figures, that was their luminous jackets. The bowing, well that was the line of men slowly lowering the heavy tracks into place. The sparks? They'd come from their equipment. And what about those MTI sockets? Well, that was just their protective goggles. It's a mystery where the expression OK comes from. Could it stand for Old Kate, a famous actress from the 1930s? Is it an abbreviation of Obraquina, an old-fashioned word for everything's fine? Or was it the nickname of an American president? What, what do, do you, you think? think? Well, in 1836, Martin Van Buren was elected American president. His nickname was Old Kinterhook, which became shortened to OK. It's a mystery to me why if I yawn, you yawn. OK, well, let's try it out. And I will bet that in the next few minutes, you feel like yawning. So here we go. Let's try and get a yawn up, OK? All right, go on. 
Oh no. Uh, uh, you got me started. <laughs> okay, so is yawning really contagious? Can you actually catch it off someone? Well, some experts say that yawning is contagious, that you really can catch it off someone. This is because yawning is a human way of trying to get everyone's sleep patterns the same so that we all go to sleep at roughly the same time. <laughs> <laughs> a yawn is a piece of body language so that we can signal to each other that we're tired and it's time to go to bed. The experts believe that it is contagious. Let's have another go. I can't stop. Here it goes, Nick. <laughs> okay, here we go. <laughs> now, there is another theory. Other experts believe that you don't actually catch it off someone else. Their theory is that when you're with a group of people and everyone starts yawning, it's not that you're catching it off someone else, it's because you're all sharing the same conditions. You could all, for example, be in a warm, stuffy room, which makes everybody feel drowsy. The body wants to take in more oxygen to stop feeling drowsy, so everybody starts to yawn. Right, we've got two theories. One says it's more to do with sharing a sleepy atmosphere and we all feel drowsy together. And the other theory says that yawning really is contagious. You can catch it off someone else. <laughs> yeah, but the most amazing thing is that whoever is right, it really does seem to be catching. Look, I bet you felt like yawning. Come on, Neil. Well, you have. <sighs> <sighs> It's incredible, I can't stop. So there you go, two theories. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs>I'm 18 years old and I come from Tunbridge Wells. Two years ago, me and 13 of my mates had the luckiest escape of our lives. The summer was coming to an end, so me and my mates thought we'd have one last final party before we had to go back to school. The party was in full swing, but the weather began to turn. We was all in the tent, asleep, and we could hear the storm, and it just seemed to get closer and closer to us. But then, at exactly 10 past three, when we were all asleep, we had the most frightening experience of our lives. It just hit us. We'd all been electrocuted. Lightning struck the tent pole at one side of the tent and it actually did pass through everybody. The lightning hit the top of the tent here, melted a hole in the metal, passed all the way through the frame. And it burnt all the side of my toes, right across the side of my foot. And I was the last to be burnt and at the hospital they said that they'd exited out through like round here, through my back. Um, and then out through my leg here, through my tire, it came out. A bolt of lightning had hit the tent, passed down the pole and travelled through each and every one of us. What I don't understand is how we all survived with just a few burns. How did all 14 of them survive? A lightning strike is one of nature's most ferocious forces. Thousands and thousands of volts sent down a simple tent pole in a split second, causing temperatures hotter than the surface of the sun your chances of being hit by lightning are around one in a million. And your chances of being hit and surviving are less. But the chances of all 14 being struck and surviving? The experts are baffled. But one factor among many could have been that inside the tent, they were all sleeping on this. A simple ground sheet. This piece of ground sheet could have been one of the crucial factors in their escape. But there again, it might just have been an incredible stroke of luck. It's a mystery why walking under ladders is supposed to be unlucky. Is it something to do with triangles? Could it be that the person on the ladder might drop something on your head? Or is it because walking under a ladder causes the displacement of air, which could make it unsafe? What do you think? Walking under a ladder is supposed to be unlucky because a ladder leaning against a wall makes a triangular shape and people used to say that a triangle was the symbol of life. Walking under the ladder breaks the triangle and is considered a bad omen. It's a mystery what the connection is between
seven bars of soap, a frying pan, a nail, something that travels at about 248 miles per hour, 60,000 miles of hose pipe, some whitewash, 10 gallons of water, 650 mussels, and a waterproof tarpaulin. Confused? Well, let's take a closer look at the clues. Seven bars of soap, a frying pan, and a nail. Any ideas? OK, let's throw in some more clues. Something that travels at 248 miles an hour, 60,000 miles of hose pipe, and enough whitewash to paint a garden shed. So what's the connection? An overly keen gardener, perhaps? A bizarre record-breaking attempt? What do you think? And if you hadn't got it yet, here are your final clues. Ten gallons of water, and a pile of mussels. And all of these things are wrapped up in a waterproof tarpaulin. Have you made the connection? Well, the clues lead to one thing. You. Yes, all of these things are just some of the ingredients that go to make up your body. Now, OK, you may not have soap in your body, but you do have enough fat to make seven bars of soap. This frying pan contains copper, and so do you. And there's as much iron in this nail as there is in you. Ow! And that pain signal has just travelled along some of the 47 miles of nerve fibres in your body at an amazing speed of about 248 miles per hour. That's fast. The hose pipe well, your body is also made up of 60,000 miles of tubes. There's arteries, veins and capillaries for the blood. And there's enough lime in your body to whitewash a small shed. Your body also contains 10 gallons of water. And the waterproof tarpaulin? Well, that's for nearly two square metres of waterproof skin, out of which up to five million hairs will grow. Oh, and the 650 mussels, well, that was just a little joke. We're talking 650 mussels. <laughs> so that's what the connection is between all of this stuff. And it all operates with the help of something the size of a cauliflower. Your brain. So that's it. Some of the world's mysteries we've solved, and some remain unsolved. Join us next time when we'll be investigating some of the many that remain. Until then, here's one last mystery for you to try and solve. You enter a cold, dark house late at night. Inside, there's an oil lamp, a gas fire, and a wood stove. But you only have one match. The mystery is, which do you light first? Can you solve it? We'll reveal the answer next time. And if you've got any mysteries that you'd like us to try and solve, or if you've had any amazing or weird experiences of your own, then please write to us at It's a Mystery, P.O. Box 1234, Maidstone, Kent, ME14 5XX. Thank you.